Closed captioning for Justice and Law Weekly is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices in support of quality public television for the Chicago area. Welcome to the Chicago Bar Association's Justice in Law Weekly. I'm Aurora Bella Astriaco, President of the Chicago Bar Association. I'm delighted to introduce Judge James F. Holderman, Chief Judge for the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. Judge Holderman was nominated to the bench by Ronald Reagan in 1985. He oversees the third largest federal court district in the nation with a budget of more than $27 million and a staff numbering over 450 people. During his tenure as chief, Judge Holderman has introduced many successful initiatives, such as e-filings and a pro se help desk, amongst others. Welcome, Judge Holderman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here because I know your schedule is very full, so we really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, before we actually get into it, um, I'd like to find out from you, give us a little bit of a background. I know you grew up in Joliet. Um, and, you know, where you went to law school, and how did you end up becoming a judge? Well, I actually uh, grew up uh, outside of uh, uh, Joliet uh, um, on a farm uh, outside of Morris, Illinois, just south of the Illinois uh, River. Right. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois College of Law. Before that, I went to the University of Illinois uh, College of Agriculture and um, uh, decided to go into law uh, late in my uh, undergraduate uh, career. And then I um, was an assistant United States attorney uh, here in the Northern District of Illinois, then went into private practice, and then uh, Ronald Reagan called me on the telephone and asked me to be a United States District Judge, and, and I accepted. That was uh, 28 years ago. Wow. I mean, getting a call from Ronald Reagan, that's, that's pretty <laughs> fascinating. Now, can you tell us about the process? I mean, just going through the process, the confirmation, how was it? Well, uh, it's slightly different now than it yeah. was then. Uh, uh, senator Charles Percy was the then senator of uh, Illinois, the Republican senator who recommended me to Ronald Reagan. And now uh, uh, Senator Durbin uh, recommends uh, uh, candidates for the uh, federal district bench to uh, President Obama. Right. Uh, senator uh, Durbin and Senator Kirk have uh, a uh, committee of, uh, of people that uh, recommend uh, potential uh, district court judges to them and then they uh, to the president and the president makes the ultimate decision as to uh, uh, who to uh, nominate right 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 now i know um judge holderman you're you're the chief judge yes um obviously you're the boss of everybody correct <laughs> um are there any extra responsibilities that you have to exercise as the chief judge Yes. Um, well, first of all, I have to correct you. I'm, I'm really not the boss. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, um, the one nice thing about uh, uh, being a federal district judge is uh, every federal district judge is a, appointed to life tenure. Uh, and so uh, uh, I merely am the, the overseer of the court. Uh, but my additional responsibilities are that I have to uh, uh, deal with the, the budgetary process. I have to deal with the administration of the court. And also here in the Northern District of Illinois, uh, the chief judge traditionally has the responsibility for overseeing grand jury matters and pre-indictment matters, such as uh, uh, wiretaps, electronic surveillance. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Constitution of the United States requires an independent judicial evaluation before the government can engage in those types of uh, things. And so uh, typically uh, here in the Northern District of Illinois, I'm the judge that makes that determination. So you're always the hot, on the hot seat when those things are, you well, know. <laughs> but behind the scenes. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, Judge Holderman, I know the court is busier than ever. Um, and in your most recent annual State of the Court address, you said that new civil and criminal filings have gone up. Yes. As a matter of fact, exceeded 10,000 filings. Um, mortgage foreclosures increased by 210 percent. I mean, it just cases, the caseloads are actually um, increasing. However, you have four vacancies. How are you? How are you handling? Well, each of the each of the judges is working harder, yeah. uh, and frankly, um, uh, we are trying to be more efficient in the way that we uh, deal with the cases before us. Uh, but primarily, it's just uh, 
the hard work of our judges, and I'm, I'm very proud of the dedication of each of the judges on our court. And, and I can tell you have the best judges. Oh, that's kind of you to so, say. Um, <laughs> and, and obviously because of the leadership that they have. Um, Judge Holderman, most of our viewers don't understand really the difference between state court and federal court. Can you tell us the difference so people understand? Well, um, there's a saying of uh, if they make a federal case out of it, uh, then it goes to federal court. And, and to some extent, there's truth in that because uh, the federal court is a court of limited jurisdiction. Uh, in order for a case to be in federal court, there has to be what's called federal jurisdiction. It has to be some type of a federal connection, either through a statute or uh, diversity of citizenship uh, uh, cases uh, between uh, uh, states and citizens of those states. Otherwise, uh, the, the case will go to the circuit court of Cook County or the other uh, circuit courts in the Northern District of Illinois. Great, great. Um, now, with the federal court, you have what they call magistrates. We do. And can you tell us what magistrate, ma magistrate judges are and what they do? Well, magistrate judges are people appointed by the uh, district court. Uh, and uh, in our district, uh, they assist us with uh, settlement conferences and civil cases. Uh, they deal with uh, preliminary matters in connection with criminal cases. Uh, and they also uh, assist us in, in pretrial matters uh, uh, at the uh, civil case level. But I, I do want to uh, just uh, uh, jump in for a second on this point of how they're, uh, how they're appointed, uh, because you, Aurora, just recently chaired the uh, Merit Selection Panel of uh, our, our Magistrate Judge uh, Selection Panel. And uh, the law requires that uh, lawyers and some non-lawyers make recommendations to the court uh, to appoint magistrate judges. And unless a person is recommended by the panel that you chaired, uh, the uh, person could never become a United States magistrate judge. So I want to thank you on air for uh, all of the effort that you put in to, uh, to do that. Thank you, Judge Holderman. But I, I have to say it is the most fair process. And really the vetting process is so incredible that, you know, whoever is recommended are fabulous, fabulous candidates. So as reflected by well, the judges that are sitting. I believe we have the best uh, magistrate judges in the country, and it's be thanks to you and the other people on your panel. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I understand there is a pilot program allowing jurors yes. to access the court's website. How does this program help jurors? Well, this is our e-juror program. Uh, any, any more, uh, most people uh, have computer access to the Internet. And so rather than uh, using the United States mail for jurors to communicate with the court and we to communicate with them, uh, we're now doing it through email, uh, the email system. And to some extent, uh, uh, the courts are always a little behind the curve, but uh, this is a, a new area that we're uh, piloting in the Northern District of Illinois to increase our ability to communicate with prospective jurors. Right. And is it being used um, at yes. this point? It, it's being used very effectively. In, okay. uh, the the prospective jurors uh, love it because yeah. it, it just is so much more efficient and right. easy. Right, right, right. Going into the juror yes. system, yes. let's talk about that, okay. um, the jury selection process. Um, as I also understand, you actually yourself was called in to be a juror. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, recently yeah. I received a summons uh, from um, the state court, the circuit court of uh, Cook County to uh, uh, appear for a uh, jury duty, and so I, I canceled my court call, I canceled the, the trials uh, that I had, and uh, um, went to uh, the uh, Georgia and Layton Criminal Court Building at 26 in California, uh, and uh, uh, waited as uh, any other juror did. Uh, fortunately, uh, I, uh, I was called to a courtroom for the jury selection process. Uh, I, I was called to uh, uh, Judge Charles Burns' courtroom. Uh, it was a a difficult uh, criminal case, and uh, I unfortunately wasn't selected to be on the jury, but um, uh, the whole experience was uh, eye-opening because uh, I was able to see the jury selection process uh, and uh, the, the process of dealing with jurors from that perspective. Right. Uh, also, it was interesting to sit there in the jury box and, and, and watch the judge deal with the uh, uh, questions and issues that I have to deal with when I'm wearing the robe, but I wasn't, uh, uh, didn't have that responsibility that day. So it right. was uh, interesting for me. 
Right. I was going to say, did you get like a special, um, you know, <laughs> special um, treatment because no. you're the chief judge <laughs> of the federal district? No, there is no special treatment, and there shouldn't be any right. special treatment. Right, right. Uh, anyone who is uh, summoned for jury duty has that responsibility. Uh, it, it's a responsibility for us to uh, to maintain our, uh, our our system of of justice in America. Uh, we are one of the uh, the few countries uh, who have the jury system in the way that we do, and uh, we rely upon our citizens in this uh, in this country. And and jury service is is, is something that uh, people, once they do it, actually enjoy it and find it to be interesting and rewarding. Right, right, right. But that's the interesting thing, though, is when people get. Um, the notice that you're going to serve as a juror. Right, you get that summons Mo in the you mail. You get the summons <laughs> in the mail. Most of the time, though, people try to get out of it. But once you get in and you've done your first jury duty, you realize how important the job really is. Absolutely, and in fact, when I uh, uh, when I went through the security at the uh, Leighton Criminal Courts building uh, that morning, uh, the two security guards uh, recognized me and said, yeah. uh, "Why are you here, Judge?" And I said, I'm here as a juror. And they, they jokingly said, well, can't you get out of it? And I said, absolutely not. No, I'm, I'm here to serve. Right, right, right. And that's good to hear from a chief judge. So that, that it does show the importance of the jury system. Um, let me ask you this. Let me change the topic okay. just a little bit and talk about jury trial procedures. All right. There are some new innovations to the Illinois Supreme Court that was enacted which allow jurors to ask questions. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, uh, it's uh, the new Supreme Court Rule uh, 243. And, and frankly, uh, uh, it allows jurors uh, during the course of, of a trial, if they have a question about the evidence that's being presented, uh, to submit that, uh, write it down on, on their notes, uh, and submit that in writing. And the judge can then uh, uh, make a determination whether uh, that uh, would be admissible evidence or not. Uh, and it's a new procedure that the judges that are using it in the Circuit Court of Cook County and, and other parts of the state really have found it to be beneficial. I uh, uh, chair of the American Bar Association Commission on the American Jury, and, and I've been using this procedure as a federal judge for um, uh, several years now. And frankly, I'm, I'm a real advocate of it. In fact, I, I testified before the Supreme Court uh, Committee when the Supreme Court was evaluating this. Yeah. But it really is a, it, it's beneficial to everybody. Uh, the jurors uh, have their questions uh, answered. Uh, and they, of course, they, have, they would have these questions anyway, uh, but now we know what they are and we can get them answered if, if they're admissible. And of course, if the information's not admissible, it's up to the judge to make right. that determination as it always is when a lawyer asks a question and, uh, the judge has to make a determination whether it's admissible, but it really is beneficial. Right, and now when you say beneficial, beneficial to the jurors, obviously because their questions are being answered. Right. Um, in the and it seems like you were the pioneer of this because you've been using it even before the Illinois Supreme Court had actually um, enacted or um, or allowed this. Right. Um, the question that I have is during those that period of time that you started it, yes. what did you find were the disadvantages or you know, the kinks in, in the system, if there were any, or is it really just truly beneficial? To well, the, uh, the, the concern was that uh, perhaps uh, uh, the jurors would try to take over the courtroom and, and become uh, uh, lawyers uh, to some extent of the questions. I have not had that experience, nor have I ever, have I ever talked to a judge who has implemented this procedure that's had that experience. Jurors want to get it right. They want to make the right decision. And so they typically don't, uh, well, I, I've never had it happen. But uh, the other benefit is uh, any more now with uh, uh, social media and our uh, ability to go on the internet to find out information, uh, jurors have the desire, if they have a question, uh, to uh, look it up. And this has uh, become a problem with uh, jury trials. And using this procedure where we allow the jurors to, if they have a question, to submit it to the court for review on its admissibility under the rules of evidence, as opposed to finding out whatever is out there on the internet, is really helpful. Uh, and frankly, that's one of the reasons why I, I advocate it. Uh, because jurors, uh, it, 
jurors have that desire. Heck, I'm old and I have the desire to pull out my handheld electronic device and look up something on the internet. But you can't do that. You have right. to rely upon the evidence that's presented and uh, jurors find this uh, helpful. Right, right, right. Is this also, if they have a question, is this where your, um, the new program that you have where jurors can access the website, is this tied into that, well, Judge Holderman? Well, yeah, the, uh, the access to the website is for the purpose of the jury selection process. Sure. Okay. And then uh, the juror questions uh, is once uh, a juror is seated in the jury box and is okay. serving as a juror, they have a question that comes up, uh, then they can submit it to the court. Right. But um, uh, the more judges uh, employ this, the more uh, helpful I think it is because it's not only beneficial to the jurors in getting their questions answered, it's beneficial to the lawyers to know what's on the jurors' minds. Uh, it's a window into the jurors' thinking. And then the lawyers can uh, make sure that the evidence that's presented, that they have, that's available, uh, is, uh, is, is the type of thing that will assist the jurors in making the right decision. Right, right, right. Now, let me just answer this from a practitioner's perspective. Sure. Um, would I have the ability to say that question is n no, that's, I, I'll object to that question because it's prejudicial to my client or whatever? Absolutely. And okay. we don't require the lawyers to make their objections in the presence of the jury. Right. Um, unlike a situation where opposing counsel asks a question that's objectionable and you right. were to object, right. that's perfectly permissible yeah. and the judge would rule immediately. But in these situations where the questions are submitted uh, in writing, then the judge will uh, provide the question to the lawyers outside the presence of the jury, and then the lawyers can make their objections uh, outside the presence of the jury, and the jury doesn't know uh, who objected if there was an objection. And when I uh, deal with these uh, uh, issues and a lawyer objection, I sustain it. I tell the jury it, it's my decision, because frankly, it is my decision. And uh, I have never found jurors to be um, offended in any way that uh, uh, their question, if they had one, uh, wasn't answered. But typically i found that the jurors have very good questions. Uh, to, uh, it's usually something that the lawyers have forgotten uh, or uh, uh, something that really is helpful to the decision-making process. Right, right, right. And, and Judge, I know that um, you know, this is going to be viewed by many people, but there's always that question, that nagging question, I think, from the public that says, well, if you're a judge or a lawyer, you can exempt yourself from being a juror. That, that's it, not. That's not the case. Right. No, one, right. no one is exempt because of their uh, status in the right. community or, or uh, their job. Uh, lawyers, judges, uh, I've had, uh, uh, as a judge, I've had, uh, uh, on occasion, I've had as many as four lawyers sitting on, uh, sitting on a jury. Uh, because uh, lawyers, doctors, uh, other professionals, uh, uh, no one is uh, no one is exempt because of that. Right, right. I have I have to say I've been called three times. Have you? But I've never <laughs> gone into a case. You know, either the case is settled or something. So I just sit there in the jury room and I wait, and I never get called. One of these days. Well, I guess be careful for what I ask for. <laughs> I, I've been called four times. This most recent time was yeah. the fourth time, and right. uh, I've made it into the uh, a courtroom three of those times, just randomly. Right. Uh, one time I had to wait the entire day in the in the uh, large assembly room, but that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, having jurors available to try cases helps those cases be resolved. Right. And um, a lot of times we may not explain that to the jurors that just by their being present. That uh, focuses the, uh, uh, the, the lawyers and the party's attention and, and they resolve the case. Right, and that's actually a very good point. Um, now, Judge Holderman, um, in addition to um, some of the things that you've introduced, one of them is actually the pro se, the help desk. Yes. Um, and I think that's a program that's been very, very helpful, especially to low income. Um, you know, defendants that go to the courtroom um, or litigants that go to the courtroom. Um, how, how is it going? And tell us a little bit more about the help desk. Well, it's, it's going very well. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, the, the idea of the help desk uh, uh, came from uh, Judge William Hibbler. We now call it the, uh, the uh, Judge William Hibbler uh, help desk at the federal court. Uh, Judge Hibbler passed away uh, uh, earlier this year. 
And, um, but it was his idea that if an individual who isn't represented by a lawyer has a case in, in uh, our court, that we should have a place uh, where they can speak to a lawyer, not to have the lawyer represent them, but give them some guidance. It helps uh, the pro se litigant. It helps the judges uh, because the pro se litigant has a, a better understanding of the process. And uh, uh, we, uh, we appreciate very much uh, the lawyers who are, are willing to uh, serve at the pro se help desk. The, um, the individual, the pro se litigant, has to make an appointment. It's on the 20th floor of, uh, of uh, the Dirksen Courthouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same floor as our clerk's office. And you, uh, the pro se litigant makes an appointment, uh, talks to uh, the lawyer uh, that day who, uh, about uh, that litigant's case, and, and gets guidance. And, and uh, helps, uh, it helps the uh, pro se litigant to have a better understanding of the processes. And how many of those cases that actually go to the help desk do get resolved fairly quickly, maybe because of the assistance of a lawyer who can help navigate the well, case? Well, the them. vast majority do. Um, and in addition to the pro se help desk, we have this other procedure um, for pro se litigants, people who don't have uh, lawyers that they've retained or, uh, or have, uh, are assisting them. And that's called the Settlement Assistance Program. And actually, uh, former uh, magistrate judge Mort Denlow uh, came up with this idea yeah. where um, uh, what, we, what we judges do is we appoint a lawyer uh, for that uh, pro se litigant for the limited purpose of assisting the pro se litigant in settling the case. Uh, and it's a, just a, it's limited to that. If the case doesn't settle, then the lawyer has no further responsibility to that uh, pro se litigant and the litigation goes on. But that has been really beneficial as well uh, because um, uh, in that instance, the uh, lawyer that is assisting the pro se litigant is actually representing the pro se litigant in the settlement process. And, um, uh, and, and it works out, uh, many, many, many of those cases do in fact settle. Yeah, which I think is really good because it reduces the caseload for a lot of the judges. Well, um, and, it, and it gets the disputes resolved. Right. It really is helpful. In yeah. a fairly economical way for, for everybody. that. Right, exactly, right. exactly. Um, do you, how do you get the volunteer lawyers to actually um, help out in, in, in that help desk? Well, um, uh, we, we let it be known, yeah. and, and frankly, um, uh, a lot of lawyers uh, do want to uh, provide uh, uh, pro bono assistance uh, in some way to the community. And, and in fact, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court uh, now is, uh, is having a further call to action for pro, uh, pro bono uh, assistance by lawyers. And it's beneficial from the standpoint that typically it's younger lawyers who wouldn't ordinarily uh, have a client of their own, uh, who wouldn't ordinarily get before a judge to uh, uh, participate in a settlement conference. And uh, it, works, uh, it works very well. So we, we do have a, a lot of volunteers. Yeah. And, and you know what, Judge? Is there a particular case that, you know, that volunteers can represent? Is it civil or criminal or is it both? Well, it's usually uh, it, it's usually in the civil area where okay. the pro se uh, litigant has brought the case uh, is a is a plaintiff in the case and has brought the action against a, an employer, a former employer, or um, uh, someone who the pro se litigant believes has harmed them. So it typically is in the uh, in the civil area. In the criminal area, when we need to appoint someone who is indigent. Uh, we have our federal defender program, right. uh, which is uh, uh, created by statute, right. and uh, uh, people are uh, are appointed from that program. Right, right. Well, amongst the other programs that you've instituted, I know the other one that's out there is the e-filing. Yes. In the federal um, courthouse, which is phenomenal because I use it quite a bit. Um, how how difficult was that to? get instituted for everyone to really get used to doing the, man, the mandatory e-filing. Well, this, this came up actually before I was chief judge, but I knew that uh, during the time that I would be the chief judge that uh, uh, it would be a, a major part of uh, the uh, litigation process in the federal court. So 
uh, I, uh, I volunteered to, to be responsible for the conversion, uh, along with our clerk of court and the other, uh, the other folks that worked in that area. But uh, electronic filing uh, allows the, the lawyers to use their computers and the internet to actually file things in court. You don't have to bring them over to the courthouse anymore. And so the courthouse is open uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, uh, all day long, uh, 24 hours a day. Right. And so filings can be made. Uh, uh, and so uh, it's worked out very well. Plus, it allows um, immediate access to the information that's filed. Uh, it used to be that you'd have to serve the other side and there'd be a delay in the filing till uh, the actual paper made it to opposing counsel. Now, as soon as something's filed, it's yeah. immediately available uh, on the uh, uh, on the electronic case file system uh, to uh, opposing counsel and everybody else. Gets a copy of it. That's right. right. That's right. Now, what about the pro se defendants who actually go to court? How do they do? Do they still do the manual filing if they don't have access to? If, the, if they don't have access, e we um, uh, we. Uh, allow their materials to be scanned in because now the official record is the electronic record, no longer right. the paper record. Right. But we also have uh, computers available at the courthouse. And uh, on occasion, although it's, uh, it, it's not often, on occasion we uh, allow uh, even pro se litigants to uh, go through the training. Uh, if they've uh, shown proficiency in electronic filing, they can even uh, electronically file. Right. And I've I did that training, Judge Holderman. Yes. Boy, I tell you, it was very intensive, which was actually very good. By the time you get done with the training, you know exactly what you, you needed to do. You know what you're doing, and, yeah. and uh, it, it helps the court, and it, and it helps the lawyers. Like you said, it's really beneficial. At first, people were concerned, especially the judges who'd, who'd never been uh, involved in that type of thing. But now everybody finds it to be helpful. Right, right, right. Well, Judge Holerman, I wish we had more time because there's so much more that I would like to ask you. But I really appreciate you coming here in a very, very hectic schedule. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Judge Holderman. Thank you. Chief Judge Holderman, thank you for discussing the important work of the Federal District Court in Illinois. I'm Aurora Balastriaco. Thank you for watching the Chicago Bar Association's Justice and Law Weekly. Closed captioning for Justice and Law Weekly is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices in support of quality public television for the Chicago area.